Welcome to LSEIQ. This month we're rerunning an episode from 2019 exploring why we need food banks, an issue that has come back into focus with the cost of living crisis. As food and energy prices soar, it's predicted that the demand for food banks will reach record highs, as those on low incomes and benefits face an uphill battle to make ends meet. People ask me what sort of people come to food banks, and I say that people like you and me, because you know these are people in a crisis. They don't want to be here. You know this idea that, that they're people who don't need it come. They don't, the people who come here are in despair a lot of the time, and they don't want to be. Welcome to LSEIQ. I'm Joanna Bale, and this is the podcast where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question. In this episode, I explore the question, why do we need food banks? The UK is the world's fifth largest economy with low levels of unemployment, yet the use of food banks has reached a record high. 1.6 million emergency parcels were given out in 2018 by Britain's largest food bank network, the Trussell Trust. This made it the busiest year in the charity's history. Many believe the growth in demand for food banks is a reflection of an increase in poverty, Others suggest that maybe supply is fueling demand. How long have you been coming to the food bank? About about three months now. It's kind of different from what I used to do. I used to actually work for the DHS for 16 and a half years. Really? Mm-hmm. So what, what changed? Changes um, redundant and then it got went down really bad. Then I had the council on top of me. They've got me in court now actually. Because the court, the council's taking 500 universal, and universal's giving me 190, and I still got to borrow money to pay 200 and something rent. So virtually, nearly 800 pound rent. So, so because of universal credit, you can't make ends meet. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big change. Universal credit. Um, mean um, the council's taking for arrears that I don't know what, why I got into arrears and also they're taking from myself as well. We're both paying arrears which they've taken me to court to repossess the old house and the judge was at the time was so mad but I'm still waiting to go back to court. That was Sharon, a client at a Trussell Trust food bank in Hammersmith, West London. I met her in a bright bustling church hall where people of all ages, some with young children, were being welcomed with offers of a drink and a snack. The room is arranged like a cafe with tables and chairs. Clients are invited to sit down and fill out a form to establish their needs. In the adjoining kitchen, volunteers make up emergency packs from food, toiletries and nappies donated by local people and supermarkets. Sharon is 58 and had recently been made redundant from her civil service job. She was struggling to pay her rent after government reforms to her benefits. Michael, a former dance teacher who was training to work in the security industry, was experiencing similar problems. Um, obviously, I had some rent arrears and stuff, and my my claim money uh, wasn't sufficient for me to live off for the for the whole month. So somebody told me about the food bank, and I did it. Um, and for the first time, I was like, "Wow, I didn't know this was available." To people. But it's a good thing because it um, it does help, you know. Um, it's it's a really now, a lot of people may feel embarrassed because of like, oh, it's, it's food that comes out to you and stuff, like, because of the social, or, um, and, but, you know, there's no shame in coming here, um, if you haven't got it, I um, mean, it's nice to have some food in your house, um, when you're on a lower income, but usually I would never sort of come to somewhere like this, but I think it's a good thing that it does help. While they are waiting for their food parcels, clients are offered advice on issues such as claiming benefits and dealing with housing problems. Daphine Aitkins is the founder and CEO of Hammersmith and Fulham Food Bank, which opens six times a week in three different locations. I asked her who her clients are and how the system works. So all of our clients are referred to us by organisations working generally on the front line. So. Uh, children's services, adult services, local government basically, uh, local council and the services they manage. 
And then, of course, there's organizations like, um, you know, schools and GPs, advice services such as Citizens Advice Service, um, organizations working with victims of domestic violence, um, people with um, all sorts of issues. So, that, so these are the organizations that meet people in crisis, and then they refer them using a voucher to us. So clients are given a voucher by these organizations. They come to us when we're open, we're open six days a week, Monday through Saturday, somewhere in the borough. Uh, and when they arrive, they're welcomed um, and, you know, make a real, uh, it's a real deliberate decision to treat people with dignity, um, to treat people with the respect that every single person does. We don't know the full story. We don't know what's going on. Um, and we don't know what people are dealing with in their everyday lives. And so we welcome them. We offer them a tea, a, a bowl of soup or a sandwich or a piece of cake, whatever it is. And then we go through the voucher system, the, vi- the voucher with them, and we pack their food. So we go through the food list with them. Um, they're given enough food to take away and eat. And pre- they're given enough food to take away and prepare up to 10 nutritionally balanced meals, um, which is about three days worth of food. If a client needs to be referred again, they need to go back to the original referring agency to get another voucher. And this helps us to keep on top and monitor the situation. Um, what we don't want is people to become reliant on the food bank um, if there are other opportunities out there. The, the reality, though, is that people... Um, the reality is that the situation can be so bad, particularly around benefits and particularly around universal credit here in Hammersmith and Fulham, that people do need to be referred on multiple occasions um, rather than just once or twice. The government decided to reform the benefits system by gradually rolling out universal credit in 2013. It was designed to simplify working age benefits and to incentivise paid work. But it's been highly controversial. I asked Daffy Nakins to explain. So people aren't just referred to us because of benefits, but those that are um, are very often dealing with the uh, problems around universal credit. So this was universal credit was introduced in Hammersmith and Fulham in uh, the summer of 2016. So we were one of the pilot boroughs. And so we've been one of the... Um, the food banks can show a dramatic increase um, over a number of years now. Um, so the problems with the universal credit are, there's this five-week wait that's been built into the system. So my understanding is that the, the one, one of the weeks, the first week, is more about the admin side. And we can understand that. We can understand that, you know, if you're going to sign up for a new benefit, yes, there's some admin needs to take place. You need to check addresses and check, you know, qualifications and all that kind of stuff. But the other part of the wait, the four-week wait, has been built in deliberately as a way of preparing people for work and being on a monthly paycheck. Now, in theory, looking from the outside, that sounds okay, fine, that sounds reasonable. But the reality is that during that wait, which is, a, is this five weeks or more, because a lot of people have a wait a lot longer, um, there is no money coming into the house. There is no um, no money whatsoever. There are no There's no housing benefit being paid. Um, and people are getting into debt. Um, they're borrowing money from friends and family. They may well um, get out an advance payment, um, which is offered to them, but that has to be paid back as soon as the new benefit starts. So you're immediately having to play catch up. So whether you've borrowed from friends and family or you've taken an advance payment, you're immediately, from the moment your first benefit comes in, playing catch up. Uh, and that's really, really tricky for people who are living already on a, on a low income um, and, it, and it's proving to have very serious consequences. We know that the that rent arrears are going up. We know that people are being made homeless. Uh, they're being evicted from their homes. They're, being, being, they're in court. Um, we know that people are suffering, you know, mental health illnesses and uh, as a result. Um, I've had a client I've had many, many, I hear many, many stories of people who have just been really badly impacted by universal credit. Aaron Reeves is a visiting senior fellow at LSE's International Inequalities Institute and an associate professor in the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at Oxford University. He has researched links between welfare reform and food bank usage. I asked him what he discovered. So I think there are two aspects to the changes to social security that have potentially had an impact. The first is um, under the, you know, from sort of 2011 onwards, there were a few reforms that, that 
increased what we call conditionality within social security. That is the kind of set of requirements that people were expected to meet in order to be eligible to claim um, various forms of social security, and particularly job seekers allowance um, early on, but, but also uh, working capability assessments for those on what was, what was incapacity benefit. And those conditions had penalties attached to them if you didn't uh, adhere to those conditions. And so they, for job seekers allowance, this was a sanction, which is where your benefits were, were temporarily stopped. And so n a large number of people that uh, have been showing up in food banks have reported that sanctions are one of the reasons that, that they end up um, using those services. And certainly in our research um, with colleagues like Rachel Loopstra um, has shown that when, when sanctions are, are rolling out, that when they're being used more frequently by job seekers, uh, job centres, that, that we see more people relying on food banks in those areas. But there's another aspect to this, which is, the, as you say, the rollout of, of universal credit. And universal credit is, is sort of doing a few things, and one of those is, is taking the, the conditions that were part of uh, other forms of Social Security and, and continuing to apply those. And actually, the sanction rates for universal credit have, um, although it's still in its early phases of rolling out, have been higher than they were under, under, uh, under kind of job seekers' allowance. And so more people are being sanctioned that are kind of in universal credit, and that seems to be part of it. One of the challenges with universal credit is that there is a delay from the point at which you apply to the point at which you actually start receiving financial support. And that delay is being debated uh, by politicians um, around whether it's the right thing to do. But at the moment, um, it has been creating challenges for people who are claiming universal credit. They have to wait a significant period of time. And so, when again, one of the, the things that our work and the work of the Trust or Trust show is that these benefit delays seem to be having an influence on driving people toward relying on food banks. Aaron Reeves found that even when problems with welfare reform are resolved, it does not result in less use of food banks. So I think one of the really troubling aspects of conditionality within the social security system in its relationship to, to food insecurity that's come out of some of the work that I've done with colleagues like led by Rachel Loopstra, for example, is that we see that sanctions uh, do seem to induce people to rely on, on food banks. But the rate of sanctioning within job seekers allowance has, has gone down dramatically, actually. So it rose very sharply, plateaued, and, and then has fallen. And what's crucial is that we don't see the same relationship with the decline in food banks. That is, when sanctions go down, we don't see food bank usage decline as quickly. And that's really important because it seems like there's a dynamic relationship there. That is, the sanction can kind of push you into the food bank, but the end or the slowing down of sanctioning doesn't seem to necessarily make it decline. And there's a variety, we don't really know the answer to this, but it could be the case that what sanctions are doing is sort of triggering an economic shock that makes you then, kind of has a kind of cascading effect that you then have to, maybe get into debt or you become um, trapped in this kind of difficult cycle where you're struggling to get yourself out and actually you continue to rely on food banks in that, um, in that circumstance. And so I think one of the, the tricky issues is we have to be very careful about the changes that are being made because simply rolling out something like universal credit may actually have cascading effect, effects even if we stop doing the the thing within universal credit that was creating the problem. Although the introduction of universal credit has been blamed for the recent increase in food bank usage, some experts also point to a deeper problem. Earlier this year, The Guardian published a letter signed by 58 leading academics and campaigners who argued that the donation of surplus food to food banks by major retailers and producers merely burnished the reputations of big business without dealing with the underlying issues of poverty. The letter said, charitable food aid is a sticking plaster on a gaping wound of systemic inequality in our societies. More recently, Philip Alston, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, published a report stating that a fifth of the population, that's 14 million people, live in poverty. He warned that the British government's policy of austerity was creating the systematic immiseration of a significant part of the British population. 
It was therefore a clear violation of the UK's human rights obligations, he concluded. His report was later condemned as inaccurate and overly political by the government. Amber Rudd, the Secretary of State at the Department of Work and Pensions, even lodged a formal complaint. Here's Professor Alston talking to Channel 4 News. I think people, the government people, haven't been out into the field, haven't had to talk to them, haven't explored what the real circumstances are. So I've had a number of people say to me, but we're not aware of this. We don't think there is poverty in our country. Uh, to which I would simply say, open your eyes, get out and take a look at the food banks. At the, you know, I spoke to one minister about food banks and he said, ah, no, this is just a, it's an occasional phenomenon. And anyway, you have food banks in Canada and the United States, don't you? Uh, as though food banks are a good phenomenon and not something to worry about. Things are grim when they're springing up and people have to demean themselves to go along and beg for food. It's and terrible. You, and you don't think there's clearly enough understanding of that among government, among people making these policies? I, I don't think it's seen as a, a deep indicator of the uh, extent of distress. Professor Alston produced his report following a two-week fact-finding mission. Laura Lane is a research officer for LSC Housing and Communities in the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion. For the past eight years, she has been following a group of 55 residents on low incomes living in Newham, East London, examining how they manage money. Newham has consistently been one of the most deprived local authorities in the country. I asked her how their lives had changed over the years. So what we found was that the triggers and the drivers for um, people struggling and for ending up going into debt seem fairly consistent with the picture um, from a few years previously. Um, with the contributing factors being temporary, part-time and casual work leading to fluctuating incomes, um, the costly and insecure nature of the private rented sector, um, and then increasing costs for general living expenses such as energy, food and household goods, um, combined with the cuts to welfare benefits. Um, what we did find was that the impact of welfare reform and the rising living costs and stagnating wages seemed to be hitting a lot harder in our most recent stage of interviewing. Um, so Newham itself, the Money Advice Service um, did some research in 2017 which showed that Newham, residents in Newham were the most likely in the country to be overburdened by debt. Um, and that's kind of defined as individuals who will find meeting monthly bills and commitments a heavy burden or having missed payments um, for three or more months out of the last six. Um, the cost of living is on the increase, um, particularly housing costs, at a time when low pay and benefits have not kept pace in an area where many jobs are low skilled and uh, equally low paid. So some of our headlines were that most of the people we interviewed were finding it difficult to balance their budgets or were just about getting by. And whilst work did provide something of a buffer, incomes were often unpredictable due to the insecure nature of the work that people were doing. Newham residents on the whole are relatively low paid, with average weekly pay being well below the national average. And Newham Council has recently identified itself that there's a problem in the borough with the underpayment of both the minimum wage and the London living wage. Um, and welfare reform and rising costs were the key factors for those people who felt that their situation had become less um, stable in the last two years. For the people that we spoke to, um, from almost three quarters of our respondents, debt was an issue in one form or another. And the type of debt varied between being an informal debt owed to family and friends, where people often preferred to borrow money um, to other um, lenders, including high cost lenders, payday lenders. Um, hidden debt was a big issue, so the form of overdue or missed payments for bills and heating. And this obviously is an increasingly important issue. It does have devastating impacts, often leading to eviction. Um, Housing is a major factor for all of the new residents that we spoke to, with people being on waiting lists for many years, often living in temporary accommodation, having to move out of the borough because of costs or losing a home. And the increasing costs of the private rented sector was a real key issue for our residents. So what's unusual about Newham, though, it, to, to make it one of the worst? Is, is there any particular um, unique uh, aspect of living in East London or that part of East London that makes life much more difficult for anyone else in, say, London, for instance? I think it's the combination of the low pay and the fact that the costs are the same as across London. So actually, the median um, monthly rent for a two-bedroom property in Newham, it was £1,400 last year. The London average is £1,450. 
um, which is obviously well above the UK national average. Um, but there seems to be a sort of difficulty of the costs in Newham are as high as anywhere else in London, but the pay um, and the levels of poverty are much higher. Some people believe that the more food banks there are, the more people will use them. So maybe supply rather than demand is driving increased usage. I asked Daphne Akins what her perception is. My understanding, I, I looking at the trust trust statistics, they've they've leapt hugely over the last since the last year's figures. Um, but at the same time, the growth of in the number of food banks, I think there's maybe four new food banks in the country in the last year. Um, there is no way that that has contributed to a, a rise or a massive rise in people using food banks. My food bank, you can see a direct correlation between the introduction of universal credit in this borough and the massive leap in the number of people needing our food bank. That is the one story that we hear over and over and over again. And, you know, it's claimants of universal credit are not just are not people who aren't working. They, they are people who are also in work, working low-paid jobs, self-employed, um, people on zero-hour contracts. It's a really big issue. We're hearing that over and over again. So it's not just people who are living on benefits that use the food bank. Aaron Reeves says food banks are more likely to be revealing an existing demand rather than creating one. The supply of food banks certainly, I think, has revealed demand that was already there. And certainly in the work that that we've done, that that will be coming out shortly, we show that food insecurity has been high and and has risen over this period, which would suggest that there is increasing demand and that is reflected in the increasing demand that we see um, in food bank usage. And certainly we're still seeing the number of food parcels being distributed through the Trussell's Trust is still going up. In fact, it accelerated between 2017-18 from from previous years. And so that isn't necessarily a supply issue. The the network size is is, is stabilised somewhat. So, but at the same time, I do think it's true that food banks have probably been though they're still stigmatised, are less stigmatised than they were before. And so I think they've become normalised in a way that they weren't 10 years ago. And so there is probably uh, some truth to that kind of change in demand slightly. It's not that people weren't needing it, but they perhaps now feel much more comfortable using them. And that is a kind of demand side uh, explanation for why we see the rises that we do. But I think the underlying problems were, were probably still there. But we have a major problem with obesity, particularly in more deprived areas. So some might even say that food banks are entirely unnecessary. Yeah, I think that's the problem of food insecurity is is actually or can overlap with the problem of obesity. That is, we can have a situation in which people don't have sufficient food to eat and they're relying on cheap food sources. And those cheap food sources tend to be calorie rich they also tend to have high levels of sugar and high levels of of fat and so this is actually a problem that we can see at the more extreme end in other places of the world where you actually have obesity and malnutrition and those problems can overlap so i don't think it's right to say that the problem uh, of obesity makes the problem of food insecurity go away i think what you can have is a situation in which actually the, the, the food sources that are provided by food banks may actually be part of the problem in that they may provide unhealthy options that are easily stored, that can be uh, preserved for a long period of time. Um, but also it might be the case that individuals are actually relying on unhealthy options to get through the month. They might want to prefer, or might prefer to buy healthy options, but, but can't uh, because they can't simply afford it. So is this the way to deal with the problem? I mean, should every town have a food bank? Or, um, and if so, isn't that just helping politicians largely on the right who want to roll back the welfare state? I mean, what happens in areas where there are no food banks? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, our, our work um, <coughs> suggests that um, in areas where there are no food banks, people go without. I mean, that... That's the problem of the, the kind of hidden hungry, which is that they're not showing up in food banks. We don't yet, although we, we have plans to formally measure food insecurity. And so we, we actually don't, we just know, we, we have a sense from the data that we do have is that there are a large number of people who are going without and don't have access to a food bank. And I think that, yes, that, that to a certain extent, 
uh, and some of the food bank charities themselves would recognize this, that, that their services are um, in some ways putting a band-aid on a much larger problem. As I mentioned before, there are food insecure people who don't go to food banks, and so food banks aren't necessarily reaching all the people that need their services. And so I think there, there is a sense in which they are, as I said, putting a band-aid on a much larger problem about inadequate access to food because of financial insecurity. And, and I think politically that is a bigger problem that, that does need to be solved. Aaron Reeves has compared the effectiveness of social security systems in dealing with food insecurity in other European countries. One of the things that we, we see in the UK is that people who experience economic shocks, so incomes de decline or they lose their job, that these are people who often end up um, using food banks. But we've done some cross-national work which compares how different social security systems respond to those income shocks. And, and what we see is that in some contexts, rising unemployment, declining wages don't necessarily lead to, to people feeling like they don't have enough food, that they can't afford the food that they need. And, and so actually that is why you can argue, I think, that we make a political choice, that we can organise our welfare systems in such a way that economic shocks like unemployment and like declining income do not necessarily mean people can't afford, to f uh, afford the food that they think they need. And we do see that in some other European countries who have managed to address that problem. Can you give me an example? Yeah. So, so welfare states that what we call kind of social democratic welfare states in some of the Nordic countries, these are countries that, that also experienced rising unemployment during the financial crisis. They, they also experienced declining wages in, in real terms, much like us. But they haven't seen the same level of increase in, in measures of kind of food insecurity, of being unable to afford the food that, pe that people think they need. And I think those are examples of countries that have been able to create systems which don't push people into food insecurity, even though they're experiencing the same kinds of economic shocks. So do they have food banks or do food banks not exist in those countries? Uh, that's actually a, a good question. They, they would have, I'm sure they would have some sort of in, uh, informal food bank system, but it wouldn't be as extensive as, as what we have here. And it's certainly, um, and because of the more robust welfare states, that people would just need it much less because there is the financial protection in place. What would need to happen for food banks to become redundant, do you yeah. think? That's a very good question. It's certainly true that uh, food banks have become institutionalised now. In a, in a very big way, and actually a part of the, the PR exercises of, of large food companies. Um, and so in terms of how do we kind of create their demise, um, th there's a, there's, this becomes a really tricky issue because of the path dependence that's created, right? Once we bring these uh, institutions into the infrastructure around how we support people on low incomes, it becomes very different, difficult to, to extricate them. I think so one move that um, some of the food charities have taken is to, to try and shift their services away from purely providing food to becoming a hub through which they access other social services. I think that's a, a useful transition for them to try and make as a way of addressing what is the underlying problems that's led you to show up in this food bank. More fundamentally, however, I think this is a problem of how the social security system is, is currently organised. So we were going through some big changes and I think inevitably there were going to be some teething problems with those changes which have meant delays, which have meant um, people got missed in those transitions and, and that has led to, to destitution and also people showing up in, in food banks. So I think some of those problems will be uh, solved as the system um, settles down. But there are, I think, systemic problems within universal credit that if they're not resolved, food banks will continue to be uh, present as part of the infrastructure trying to address problems of poverty. And so what I think needs to happen is uh, a big transition in how we think about what Universal Credit is trying to do, both its generosity, but the way that it's organised in terms of its conditionality. And I think a bigger change in terms of the labour market more broadly and a wider conversation about solving the problem of in-work poverty. And I think until those three things happen, food banks will be part of how our country responds to poverty.
Back at the food bank, I asked Daphne Akins about the well-being of her clients, some of whom were visibly distressed. I can't tell you how many times a client has told me that they've been that they consider suicide, that that's something they think about. Um, that's really scary. Um, I've heard in other parts of the country that people have committed suicide. Um, I'm not aware of anyone here in Hammersmith and Fulham, but I am aware that our clients are really struggling to get out of bed in the morning um, because of depression and anxiety. Um, they're not lazy people. I mean, my, my, the people that I meet in the food bank are generally articulate, intelligent, you know, people who want to make a go of life, um, but they've been beaten down by the system. I did have a mum come in who has faced a couple of years. She was one of the first people to get put onto Universal Credit in 2016. And, and she has never, that, that family, lovely family, um, have never really recovered. Um, and she came in a few months ago and, and she'd slit her wrists, you know, because, you know, one more thing, she got fined uh, by the NHS for claiming a free prescription, which she was actually entitled to, but there was a mistake was made and she got this £100 fine. It was just like one more thing she just didn't need. And when you've got, when you're being bombarded with problems, um, it's very hard to keep going. Some of the clients I spoke to had long-term mental or physical health issues, which meant they were unable to work. Daphne told me this was very common. Yeah, about, we, we did um, a research project a small research project last year and we it was something that we knew anecdotally but it was confirmed through this research project that you know about 50 percent of our clients in Hammersmith and Fulham um, are people who have a physical or mental health is- issue mm-hmm. so um, that makes it much harder to cope um, and you know people who are struggling with mental health or physical disabilities also fare badly under the new universal credit benefit system. They're struggling to make sure that they're getting um, their PIP, that they're getting the right support that they need. I asked Daphne if she thought that some people are still too ashamed to come to food banks. Well, a lot of the people who do come have left it quite a long time before they arrive. So just last week I met a mum with a couple of children and they hadn't uh, eaten for two days. Um, a lot of the people who come to us, yeah, they report they haven't eaten for a day, for a couple of days, for a week. Um, people, this is not, a food bank is not somewhere that people want to come to. It is not a, a yes, I'll go to go, yeah, I'm going to go along to the food bank, you know. I mean, once they've been a couple of times and assuming that they need to be referred again, we create a, a friendly and welcoming environment so it becomes less scary to come to. But for that first couple of visits, or certainly that first visit, it's not easy. Um, and um, we do frequently hear reports from people who say that, you know, they've waited to come. They've waited until they're really, really desperate. Um, they waited until, actually a lot of people say that they waited until, you know, they, they, it was actually struggling. They were struggling to feed the kids. Um, they will, parents will go for days without eating. They will eat the barest minimum to get by. But when they actually... When the kids are hungry, that's when they do make the visit to the food bank. Finally, to answer this episode's question, I asked Aaron Reeves, why do we need food banks? I would say there's two answers to that question. One is I don't think we do need food banks. That that's actually a choice that we're making um, politically as a society to rely on them when we could be using other mechanisms to provide people with enough to afford the food that they need. But more broadly, why is it that they've been rising is because of the the spread of food banks, I think, has revealed the problem of food insecurity in this country. It was much more widespread than people believed. And on top of that, welfare reform has compounded that, creating additional demand among people on low incomes, and particularly those who are experiencing disability or some sort of physical impairment. Here's Laura Lane. I think the key factors behind the need for food banks is probably fairly similar to uh, many of the reasons for our interviewees in Newham ending up in financial difficulties. From our research we saw that five five of our 55, so 10%, had used uh, food banks recently but almost half had actually cut back on their spending on food. Um, And one of our interviewees talks about how she feels very supportive about the welfare system and feels that it plays a key role in helping people but she feels that at the moment there's not enough 
help. Um, so she talks about many children going to school without breakfast and it's shocking to hear that people go to food banks and the kind of people who go there, like nurses for example, it's shameful in this day and age that people are not earning enough to feed themselves. And finally, Daffy Nakins. It's very complicated. Um, I, you know, I don't think it's any one problem. It's probably a, 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 a very complex. But certainly at the moment, we need more investment in the benefit system. Um, we need to make sure that people can afford to buy food, that there's no stigma or embarrassment attached to being able to prepare a meal for your children. Uh, we have to ensure that every child has enough to eat every day, that every child has three meals a day. We need to ensure that every child has access to a good education, has is, is in um, good accommodation, safe, adequate accommodation, that they have the clothes to wear, that they have beds to sleep on, um, that they have parents who are able to um, parent without the distractions of, of, of major stress caused by poverty. We We will never... Well... I hate to think what the impact of a childhood lived in poverty will have on the on, on the children um, that I see. There's often a lot of children in the food bank, and they come with their parents, and um, they're the ones that I kind of think about at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I wake up in the night, because we we just don't know the damage that we're doing um, to these children who don't know don't know a life without not knowing where their fruit next meal is coming. They don't know what it's like to have parents who aren't really stressed out, working as many jobs as they can do, but struggling to pay the rent, struggling to put food on the table. Children who are really deprived, you know, who stand out and are different. Not all the time, but some are different from their peers, and it's really hard. It's, it's the children living in, in a temporary accommodation, emergency accommodation, um, shared with lots of other people. They're not, are they, you know, what's... I just worry about them. I just worry how safe are they and what does their future look like um, when they've lived with, in, in, with poverty. Tell us what you think using the hashtag LSEIQ. This episode of LSEIQ was brought to you by Joanna Bale, Tom Williams and Ollie Johnson. Want to explore the issue of food banks in more depth? This episode was based in part on the following research. The rise of hunger among low income households, an analysis of the risks of food insecurity between 2004 and 2016 in a population based study of UK adults by Rachel Loopstra, Aaron Reeves and Valerie Tarasuk. Impact of welfare benefit sanctioning on food insecurity, a dynamic cross area study of food bank usage in the UK by Rachel Loopstra, Jasmine Fleder-Johan, Aaron Reeves and David Stuckler. The growing disconnect between food prices and wages in Europe. Cross-national analysis of food deprivation and welfare regimes in 21 EU countries, 2004 to 2012, by Aaron Reeves, Rachel Loopstra and David Stuckler. Managing the unmanageable, debt and economic resilience in Newham, by Laura Lane and the LSC Housing and Communities team. Facing Debt, Economic Resilience in Newham by Laura Lane and the LSC Housing and Communities team. Never Just a Number, Evaluating the Impact of a Holistic Approach to UK Poverty by Anne Power, Bert Provan, Laura Lane and Eleanor Benton. Join us next time when we ask, what's the future of capitalism? For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover.